Good morning and welcome to our service from TABS today. We are still meeting online, but we are so happy that you could join us. Before we go to worship, I'm going to hand over to Julian for notices. Oh, good morning. Three notices this morning, fairly short, I hope. One is to regard in our church members meeting, which we held on Wednesday the 28th of October, starting at 7.30. Details will be sent out to you of how you can log on to that meeting will be by Zoom the opportunity there for you to see what's happening and to share uh, on that occasion. And then in November, we'll have our annual general meeting. The next notice is regarding MAF. We have a competition that's been running for quite some while. With the beginning of November, that competition will come to a conclusion and there will be an opportunity there for prizes then to be given to those who've entered that competition. And then finally, you may not realize it, but there are 77 sleeps until Christmas. Don't be worried about that. But we are thinking very much about our Christmas services. And we like to have something a bit more creative sometimes within those services. So if you have any ideas, please contact one of the elders and we'd only be delighted to listen to what you have to say and see how we can incorporate those ideas into those services. Now I hand over to Claire, who's going to pray. Well, this morning we're starting a, a new series on Paul's first letter to Timothy, and we've called it Walk This Way thinking about how we live out our Christian lives today. And we're going to be looking at things like dignity and integrity and perseverance. And um, so we are going to pray now before we start. Heavenly Father, we have come together to worship you this morning. Lord, we want to offer you our praises, the praises of our mouths, the praises of our work, the praises of our money, and give it all to you. Father, would you send your Holy Spirit that you would be with us this morning and that we would cause our hearts to sing. Amen. And Reese is now going to lead us in sun worship. Good morning, everyone. Uh, just before we come and sing together this morning, I wanted to share some words from Psalm 100. Uh, it says, make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness continues to all generations. Let's come and sing together. As we come into your presence, we remember every blessing that you poured out so freely from above. Lifting gratitude and praises for compassion so amazing. Lord, we've come to give you thanks for all you've done. Because of your love, we're forgiven. Because of your love, our hearts are clean. We lift you up with songs of freedom. Forever we're changed because of your love. We remember every blessing that you poured out so freely from above. Lifting gratitude and praises for compassion so amazing. Lord, we've come to give you thanks for all you've done. Because of your love, we're forgiven. Because of your love, our hearts are clean. We lift you 
world, with songs of freedom, forever with change, because of your Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the command of God our Saviour and of Christ Jesus our hope, to Timothy, my true son in the faith, grace, mercy and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. 
as I urged you when I went into Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus so that you may command certain people not to teach false doctrines any longer or to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. Each things, such things promote controversial speculations rather than advancing God's work, which is by faith. The goal of this command is love, which comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Some have departed from these and have turned to meaningless talk. They want to be teachers of the law, but they do not know what they are talking about or what they so confidently affirm. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has given me strength, that he considered me trustworthy, appointed me to his service. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy. I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord, G Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason that I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive, receive eternal life. Now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honour and glory for ever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning. Thank you, Liz, for today's reading and Rhys for leading us in worship so far. This morning, we're beginning a new series entitled Walk This Way, looking at the book of 1 Timothy from the New Testament. This will take us up to the beginning of Advent. One of the roles I've been privileged to undertake as a teacher is to mentor students who are training to become teachers themselves, supporting and passing on advice from my own experience. It can be quite daunting taking the first steps into the profession and looking back on it, I remember it well. So many of us had visions and dreams of being like Robin Williams from the Dead Poet Society, standing on a table with pupils reciting, Oh Captain, my Captain. The actual reality of the classroom in a primary school brings us down to earth with a bump. There are the first few days where you acclimatise the school setting and are overwhelmed by a pile of information that you need to assimilate in order to be let loose on the class. Then the realisation of the task in hand as you're presented with 30 children, all with their own agendas, whose education you're responsible for for the period you're in the school. There's assessments and regular observations of teaching style, management techniques, content and understanding of what you're teaching. It's always good to have someone to turn to for support, for guidance and encouragement, especially when you are questioning why on earth you've got yourself into that situation, thinking, why was this a good idea? The book of 1 Timothy is known as one of Paul's pastoral epistles. Paul's other letters, such as Romans, Ephesians and Colossians, are meant for a broader audience. 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy and Titus are written to specific people who Paul is advising on how best to lead their local churches. 1 Timothy offers practical advice and pastoral advice from the ageing apostle Paul to a young pastor named Timothy, who is working in the church at Ephesus. More than a decade prior to writing his letter, Paul had first met Timothy in the city of Lystra in Asia Minor, where Timothy was known and respected by the Christians, written in Acts 16. Upon recognising Timothy's qualities, Paul recruits the young man to travel with him. Paul's release from prison at the end of the book of Acts allowed him the opportunity to return to Ephesus where he discovered that during his absence, it had become a centre of false teaching. This was a sad fulfilment of the prediction he had made to the Ephesian elders in Acts 20. Paul eventually placed Timothy in leadership of the ministry at this church, before moving on to preach in Macedonia. Later on, hearing reports of Timothy's work at Ephesus, he's prompted to write 1 Timothy, probably about AD 63. 
Paul was acting like a mentor to Timothy, passing on knowledge and understanding from his years of experience. He knew Timothy had a difficult job. He hoped that his letter would both equip and encourage him in the task. As we look at this passage today from 1 Timothy in chapter 1, we're going to be thinking about how we can be confident in understanding our faith and the importance of this in our Christian life. At the beginning of the chapter, Paul sets out his credentials. He introduces himself as Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Saviour and the Lord Jesus Christ our hope. This was done as a personal encouragement to Timothy, and also so the letter could be used as a letter of reference by the Ephesian Christians. He then identifies Timothy as a true son in the faith. Grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul could consider Timothy a true son in the faith because he probably led him and his mother to faith in Jesus on his first mission in Acts 14 and Acts 16. This also expressed Paul's confidence in Timothy's integrity and faithfulness to the truth of the Christian message. When writing to the churches, Paul would often include the greeting grace and peace. Yet in starting this book, he added the term mercy, indicating he understood there were difficult times in the Ephesian church and that Timothy was having to deal with this. In life, we have to deal with difficult situations we find ourselves placed in. This may be to do with work. It may be to do with relationships between family or friends. Sometimes these issues are caused by our own actions or behaviour, whilst at other times we may find other people's actions are at fault. During my life, I've often found myself in tricky situations caused by a variety of different circumstances, some self-inflicted, and I need to make difficult decisions. As human beings, we often refer to our response as fight or flight. Do we choose to run away from a situation or bury our heads in the sand to avoid dealing with issues? Or do we stand up and take responsibility? Do we fight for our position? This was one of the issues which Paul was seeking to address with Timothy in writing his letter. In verse 3, he's urging him to stay in Ephesus and to stay with the scriptures. There'd be a number of reasons why Timothy may have wanted to leave Ephesus. He might have missed Paul and he wanted to be with his mentor. He might have been intimidated by following Paul's ministry. He seems to have been somewhat timid or reserved by nature and was perhaps intimidated by the challenge. He might have been discouraged by the normal difficulties of ministry. He might have even been questioning his own calling. And he certainly would have been frustrated by distracting and competing doctrines that were swirling around the Christian church in Ephesus at that time. Despite all these reasons, there is no doubt that God and the Apostle Paul wanted Timothy to remain in Ephesus. And the rest of Timothy chapter 1, Paul gives Timothy at least five reasons why he should stay there and finish the ministry God had given him to do. The first was because they needed the truth in 1 Timothy 3 to 7. The second was because God uses unworthy people, which he writes about in verses 12 and 16. He says he's a, he needs to serve a great God in 1 Timothy 17. He says he's in a battle and cannot surrender. And finally, because not everyone else does. And he's calling him to stay there and continue the work. We can see in the passage that Timothy was having to deal with false doctrine. They were moving away from the truth of the Christian faith. And Paul had probably dealt with these false teachers personally whilst in Ephesus. Timothy was being encouraged to stay in Ephesus and continue his ministry. So, what does this mean for us today? How can we strengthen our faith? How do we continue to be faithful? Today, I want to share three themes linked to Paul's teaching in the rest of the verse that we can apply to our own lives. The first of these is that we need to study the scriptures. We need to teach and study the correct doctrine. This is not only meant to preserve truth, 
but it's also meant to show a good example. This means to study, to think, to walk by the Holy Spirit and believe God. We need to be teachable from God, not to get sidetracked by strange, possibly interesting teachings, myths or stories that have developed over time and some people take as biblical truth. It wasn't that there was an elaborate anti-Jesus theology occurring in Ephesus. It was more that they tended to get carried away by emphasising the wrong things. Paul wanted to prevent the corruption that came when people gave authority to fables and endless genealogies instead of the true doctrine. Paul had left the Ephesian Christians with a particular set of teachings. He was concerned that Timothy did everything he could to make sure the Ephesians continued in that doctrine. Paul did this because doctrine is important to God and it should be important to us as people. Today, in the spirit of the modern age, we've been influenced by modern Christians and by modern teachings. We live in a day where Pilate's question, what is truth, from John 18, is often answered, whatever it means to you. Yet truth is important to God and should be to his people. Paul emphasises in 1 Timothy verse 5 that we need to develop love for one another, build a good conscience and follow it. We need to be genuine, not play acting or dramatic in our faith. The purpose of the law is found in its inward work upon our hearts, not in our outward observance. Without this understanding, it's easy to become shallow and legalistic. Only concerned about our outward performance and appearance. We're called to love from a pure heart. This suggests that the problem in Ephesus was along Jewish-type legalistic lines. They misunderstood the commandment and the law. When we're spending time in God's word, it should produce love from a pure heart, a good con conscience, being sincere and faith in us. If it's not, something is wrong. Paul also highlights in verse 16 that we need to be patient with those to whom we witness and to those whom we teach. Sometimes it takes longer for others to respond because they're not in the right place. The second point I want to highlight is that we need to be faithful. Paul writes in verses 12 to 14, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has enabled me because he has counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor and an insolent man. But I obtained mercy because I did it, ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. If we look at I thank Christ Lord Jesus our Lord has enabled me, we see Paul was entrusted with the gospel because Jesus enabled Paul. And Paul thanked Jesus for that enabling. Paul was enabled for this ministry because he was counted faithful for the ministry. Faithfulness made Paul ready to be used by God. We often see our Christian service as a matter of volunteering. Yet as Christians, in regard to Jesus and his church, we're not volunteers. We're called to be servants following Jesus' example. And faithfulness is expected of servants. Paul writes, he counted me faithful. You don't need to be smart to be faithful. You don't have to be talented or, or gifted. Faithfulness is something very down to earth and each of us can be faithful in the place God has placed us. Many people wait to be faithful. We tell ourselves, I'll be faithful when I'm in such and such a position. That's just foolish. We should be faithful right where we are. Our faithfulness is even shown in the small things. Paul expands in verse 18 where he continues, Faithfully serve in your area of gift and ability. We need to engage in the Christian life, to share the message of Jesus and our faith in God, to serve others like Jesus showed. There will be opposition. We need to think biblically and act biblically. Today, you may be asking lots of questions about your life. What am I doing? What should I be doing? This may be related to work, family, church or Christian life. You may be in a position in work or serving in the church because you were prompted by God through a scripture or a prophecy from another Christian. 
but maybe questioning if you're the right person or are in the right place. In verse 18 of this, uh, this letter, Paul reminds Timothy, I'm giving you this command in keeping with the prophecies once made about you. He wanted Timothy to consider what the Holy Spirit had said to him through the others in the past. We shouldn't think it strange that God would speak to us through others in a prophetic manner, but we must take care to test all prophecies, as shown in 1 Corinthians 14, according to God's word. If we're questioning today, I wonder if we need to faithfully follow through on what God's entrusted us with. The final point I want to bring is that we need to trust God. In verses 12 to 17, give a brief version of Paul's testimony. Timothy already certainly knew this story, but he would have been encouraged that Paul referred to himself as the foremost of sinners. Paul brings up these details for several reasons. One is to point out that he was not any better or more deserving than anyone else he is criticising. On the contrary, Paul shows how serious his own sins were. He'd even insisted in and approved of the execution of Stephen in Acts verse, uh, chapter 7. Paul also means to highlight the fact that his redemption is entirely the work of God, an act of mercy, not something Paul earned on his own. Paul's boasting was mostly about his own weaknesses. What he wrote most about was of God's grace being sufficient for all. One thing that I have learned about Paul is that he never got over his own salvation. He never got over that God could love someone so much who was against God so much. That God could forgive him enough because of his hate and persecution of Christians. Maybe you haven't made a commitment to follow Jesus. You may think that God couldn't forgive you, or you're not sure if you deserve God's love. Yet in Jesus, he sent the answer as a perfect sacrifice. And all we need to do is to believe in him and follow him. Jesus came into the world to save us from our wrongdoings or our sins. His mission was to expressly seek and save the lost rather than to judge people. This is the central belief of the Christian faith, that Christ died Christ rose from the dead and that he will return again at the end of time. If you're already a Christian, you may have forgotten what it was like for yourself to be lost. I pray we never forget that we're serving a God who desires a personal relationship with us and the importance of continuing to deepen our relationship and faith. Paul tells us in verse 14 that we need to trust God to supply what we need in our life and service. Our faith needs to grow and our love leads to grow. God favours us with the ability. He also writes in verse 19 that we need to continue to believe in God in whatever circumstances we find ourselves. Paul concludes his final instructions for Timothy by reminding him to faithfully carry out his ministry. Paul specifically names three things for Timothy to keep in mind. Fight the good fight. Keep his faith and keep a good conscience. Timothy had to have the faith that God was in control, that he would guide him, and that Timothy continued to seek him. He had to have a good conscience because his enemies would be attacking him. And if Timothy didn't conduct himself rightly, then they would have good reason to attack. A good conscience isn't just a conscience that approves us, but one that approves us because we've been doing what is right. It is connected with good conduct and right living. Paul's letter to Timothy raises issues that are still relevant for us today. We need to heed his advice in our own lives in order to strengthen and to develop our own faith in God the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. As we move forward today in our faith, let us not forget the truth that we hold to. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Hallelujah. Well, thank you, Simon, for your message. And we're going to turn to prayer for a few moments. Um, I was remembering a time when we travelled to Uganda about six years ago. And we, we went around various churches and projects visiting them. But everywhere we went, the children would finish their prayers with the words, God is good all the time. All the time, God.
God is good. And I would just encourage you to remember and to hold fast to that truth this morning, that God is good all the time. So let's pray. Mighty, holy, just and merciful God, you love each one of us and we thank you and praise you this morning that in your love you sent your son Jesus to die for us, that we might be forgiven of our sins, that we might be able to live in relationship with you. And Lord, we thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit that lives in us and causes our hearts to worship. And as we praise you, we thank you that your purposes are being worked out here on earth. That despite sickness, despite political and social unrest, despite racial tensions and economic uncertainty, you are on the throne and God, you are good all the time. Lord, we pray that you would heal our world of this sickness and all other evil and sadness that beset it. Lord, we pray against loneliness and fear, addiction and abuse. We pray against anxiety. Father, would you raise up men and women who would be seeking after your justice in the world. Lord, that would challenge power's authority, would speak truth to authority. Lord, we pray for those who seek to lead, be it in schools or hospitals, in the workplace, in churches or in government, be it at local or international level. God, you are good all the time. And Lord, we pray as well for those um, whom we love. Lord, we pray that they would know your love, your joy and your peace, that it would rule in their hearts. Lord, would you strengthen the weak? Would you give rest to the weary? Or would you comfort the lost and the broken hearted? Lord, we take a moment to remember all those whom we miss, our friends and family that we long to be with, that we just want to hold and to embrace. Lord, we pray that at this moment they would know your love and embrace, that they would feel your arms around them and that you would give them peace. And Lord, we bring these prayers together, remembering that you are good all the time as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Reese is going to lead us in one final act of worship. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning, it's time to sing your song again, whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name, and sing like never before, O oh my soul, I'll worship Your holy is 
great and your heart is kind for all your goodness i will keep on singing ten thousand reasons for my heart to find and bless the lord oh my soul oh my soul worship his holy Sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name. And on that day when my strength is failing, the end draws near. And my time has come Still my soul will sing your praise unending Ten thousand years and then forevermore And bless the Lord, oh my soul Oh my Worship His holy name And sing like never before Oh my soul I'll worship Your holy name And bless the Lord, oh my soul Oh my soul Worship His holy name Sing like never before Oh my soul I'll worship your holy name As we finish this morning May God the Father prepare your journey. Jesus the Son guide your footsteps. The Spirit of life strengthen your body. The three in one watch over you on every road that you may follow. Let's share together in the grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Strength arises, we wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. Strength arises, we wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord our God. You reign strong.